Hi, this is Guy Wallace, and in this video I'd like to discuss my approach to instructional system design at the lesson level. Now I do a backward chaining approach to instructional design, but uh, in an ideal sense I typically would have analysis data coming from the prior phase to my approach to an addy like uh, method where I do uh, phase one project planning and kickoff, phase two analysis, phase three design, phase four development, phase five pilot testing, and phase six revision and then release into whatever the uh, ongoing delivery or access systems that my clients have. Uh, but not, I don't always have analysis data and sometimes I have to jump in and, and start the design and back into analysis data, if you will. And so what I'd like to convey in this video is a time when I met with a brand new client, one of my clients at AT&T Network Systems back in the early 90s, introduced me to one of their peers who had a need for developing some instruction. And by instruction, I mean uh, standalone job aids, if you can do with that, um, job aids embedded in training where the performance is tricky and you can't expect people to memorize things and maybe you don't want them to so that you give them some form of guidance or job aids or performance support workflow learning is sometimes referred to um, or you address training where you're trying to help the learners memorize knowledge memorize skill sets um, because perhaps in their performance context, there's no time for any referencing of any kind of materials to support their performance. They have to have that committed to memory and it has to be at the ready. But uh, this uh, new person uh, prospect that I was uh, meeting with uh, started to describe their request. And I did my best active listening to you know, let them know that uh, I heard what they were saying and then I probed further with additional questions, um, trying to understand their performance. And then we discussed how I, we would go about doing this. And I was, when I mentioned doing analysis before design, before development, um, they thought that, you know, that wasn't necessary and we should just be able to kind of jump in and uh, just do it as the uh, phrase has become known. Um, and uh, so I, so I had uh, recently, or just previously, uh, back in 1990, created a thing called the Lesson Map. And this was my intent to use a facilitated group process with a group of people and to actually design a modular training and development event. And the modules within an event, in my language, in my, my framework, is a lesson. And the lesson is composed of information, demonstration, and application exercises. So I call them infos, demos, and apos. But uh, so the lesson map is kind of the heart of my instructional design approach. And so I, uh, when they decided that they didn't need that, that they could just tell me what needed to go in there, you know, uh, I learned from the late Joe Harless, um, never to say no, to always say yes, and let me, uh, I can help you even further if we do a little analysis. But it's not appropriate to always challenge a prospect. And so I jumped up to their whiteboard um, and started, uh, I framed out my uh, lesson map. And I started asking them about uh, the objectives. At the top of my lesson map, I have the title and other information. I have a place uh, of, of, in the format to capture objectives, both performance objectives and learning objectives. So, you know, what do you be able to be able to do how to do and then what you need to know to be able to do and get that clarified. And then I have three columns, one for info, one for demo, one for APO. Uh, and there's always an open and close in the information column. But um, so I jumped up to, uh, to and drew out this format really rough. And then I asked them, so what about the how to's? What will people be able to do after they've taken this instruction, this training that they wanted? And they articulated it and I wrote it down really rough. I don't worry about the three-part behavioral objectives and all that kind of stuff when I'm roughing something out. I just captured what they said so they would know that I heard them. And now comes the Socratic tricky part where I'm asking leading questions. And like a good lawyer, you always know what, uh, what you're kind of looking for, but oftentimes you don't when you're doing this kind of an instructional design approach. 
But I, so I asked them, so what do you really need to know to be able to do and meet those performance objectives? That was the first thing that I wrote down. And I have 17 categories of enabling knowledge and skills. And so I kind of systematically went through all 17 of them and ask them, you know, what about company policies and procedures? What about laws, regulations, and codes? What about internal organizations that you need to work with? What about, are there any external organizations you need to work with in order to be able to meet that performance objective? And I ran through all 17 of them and um, wrote down just brief little bullet points, if you will, in the place where I would normally put a three-part behavioral learning objective after I had uh, articulated the three-part behavioral performance objective. Um, but that's when you polish up a lesson map, not when you're first roughing it out, especially in an intake process. So I captured the key things that you needed to know to be able to do, and that was the first part. So then I went to the very bottom of the right-hand column, which is the application exercise or APO column, and, and I asked, and I drew a box. And I said, okay, so here's the final exercise. We can consider this final exercise to be kind of the test as to whether or not the learners, the target audience, uh, has the knowledge and skills and capabilities, the performance competence to do the job. So what would that exercise look like? And because we'd already talked about the performance objectives and the learning objectives, I had a sense for that, but now here I'm Socratically getting them to say what that final practice would look like. And I always talk about practice with feedback. And so I, we, I roughed out a name for what they said and the type of exercise it was. Now you can use real work, you can use simulated work, you can use kind of a talk through of the work, like a case study might be where you're not actually, you know, performing tests to produce outputs. You're talking about various situations or whatever in a case study. But I like to go for uh, real work would be ideal, but it's usually not feasible. I usually use some sort of a simulation of that authentic real work. What tasks do they perform to produce an output? And then we can measure both the output and the tasks that people perform in a, in a simulated environment, training, instruction. Um, so I, I, then my next question for them is that, well, so how many exercises would there be to actually make sure that people have had enough practice with feedback before they go back to the work? And I, at that point, I usually start talking about, uh, you know, four levels of, of potential application exercises. Uh, sometimes you don't need that many because that's scary to talk about four sets of exercises for people. But I would talk about you start off with, you know, something that's kind of easy peasy, build initial confidence, uh, and then you move on to um, additional uh, desirable difficulties. So you kind of make it the next one difficult. And then you might make the next, the third application exercise, the third APO, darn difficult. And the fourth application exercise, I usually refer to it as from Hades, all hell breaks loose. And now you're dealing with the worst case scenario. And we've walked you from easy peasy to difficult to darn difficult to from Hades. And that's kind of the acid test. Can you do something when we throw in all sorts of other issues for you to deal with? So I laid out the number of application exercises that they were willing to entertain at that point. I don't get too excited because most clients don't like the idea of lots of application exercises, practice with feedback sessions. They usually minimize the number that's really needed, but, but that's okay because that's this is we're just roughing something out at this point. So I put those together and then I asked them a question, do we need to demonstrate that performance Put something in the demo column, the middle column of my three columns uh, underneath the uh, title and the objectives. And in the demos, what I like to do is I like to show people what those exercises are going to be. So it's kind of an advanced organizer for the application exercises themselves. And sometimes you can show, you know, in today's world, back then we couldn't do this as easily, but we'd show a video of this is what the performance actually looks like. And maybe the target audience needs that because they've never seen it before, or maybe they've come from that environment and they know, they know well, uh, very well what that looks like. Um, um, and then I also start talking about the slow mo demos, um, where because the hand is quicker than the eye, and we want to maybe slow things down. And today we might use augmented reality to point things out 
put little labels on the video, stop motion with the video and point something out tricky. We may want to back up a little bit and show that part again and maybe even again so that people can understand and see some of the nuanced uh, physical behaviors or we want to label the cognitive behaviors, the thinking processes that are people are going on. Maybe we put a little thought bubble over the performer's head to say, oh, I need to make this decision or this discrimination, et cetera, uh, as I'm performing the tasks. And so that demonstration can serve a purpose here, getting people ready for the application exercise, building their confidence that they can go in there and start doing those kinds of things. You know, that's all good stuff. But uh, so we talk about the whether there's a need for a demonstration, yes or no, and the client would to told me and I put uh, something in there. And I don't remember to this day exactly what, what I did on this, but I do have a general uh, uh, reminiscence of the uh, what we did and uh, how that worked out. Uh, and I'll get to that point in a minute. Uh, so then after there's a demonstration, yes or no, then I start talking about the information. Now I've already captured what some of the information might be because I went through my 17 categories of knowledge and skills to tease out what do you got to know to be able to do as I articulated my two types of objectives, performance objectives first, uh, to set the stage, if you will, the uh, uh, enabling knowledge and skill objectives, the learning objectives. Um, so I could capture that. And so I started looking at that and to asking them and drew little boxes in the information column then. Um, and I don't worry about the sequence. I'm just trying to capture, here's the chunks of information that we need to give people uh, before they see the demonstration, before they do the application exercises. And so, I, our, so in asking them questions about those chunks of information, it became apparent to me, <laughs> probably just shortly after it became apparent to them, that they didn't know the answers. They didn't know, you know, they knew there were maybe regulations and codes that you needed to comply with when you're doing this performance, but they couldn't tell me, you know, what regulation, what code. They, did, they didn't know. They knew there were some, but they didn't know the specifics of it. And it was kind of an aha moment for them, uh, quite Socratically uh, uh, arrived at, um, because I know that requesters usually don't do the job at a level of mastery and say they don't know what a master performer knows about what do you really need to know at a detailed level. So, you know, rather than embarrass them by, you know, sticking on that one box, I just wrote a question mark uh, after I gave it a title, regulations, and put a question mark in there because we really don't know and asked about the other things. And it became very apparent to them uh, that they didn't know the answers to my question. They did not know in any great detail what information was required by the performers uh, in order to perform. And so we couldn't really articulate all the information that would be given to somebody before a demonstration, before an application. And that's how I Socratically convince clients that maybe we do need to do a little um, analysis and we do need to understand what are this information and in when I'm doing when I did that in that intake process it became a, you know very aware to them that that yeah there's things to know before you be able to do and guy needs to do this analysis and he probably won't be doing analysis paralysis because I could ask very pointed questions of them they could answer but if I was talking to a master performer then I could get that information then I have to start talking about the fact that the research shows that experts, or actually any one of us, only knows about 30% of what we would need to tell a novice in order for them to perform. Most of our knowledge, our everyday knowledge, is uh, non-conscious. Um, when we drive a car, we're not consciously, you know, pressing on the brake just a certain amount or whatever. We just do things. We're on automatic pilot. And master performers are as well. So the trick is when you're talking to a master performer, what they tell you might be accurate, may not, um, but it's mostly going to be accurate uh, unless they're making things up because they're embarrassed because they really don't know. Uh, but most of the time they're going to give you a partial set of the uh, behavioral tasks, the cognitive tasks that they perform to produce an output. Um, they don't consciously think about this when they're doing it most of the time. They're just doing it. They've mastered it. They've learned it over time. Uh, and we want to em have the learners uh, become performers that emulate master performers and learn, you know, their tricks of the trade, so to speak, 
but they can't tell us. So then you're either going to do a series of interviews with people and figure out what are the deltas, the differences between what they told you, and then go do a circle back to all of them saying, well, the second person, third person said this when you're talking to the first person again for the second time. And they either confirm or deny that additional information that you've got, or they take exception to it. And so that can become a, a you know, going around and around and around with the uh, master performers. So back in early part of my career, back in actually 1979, I got frustrated in designing a video script. Uh, I was on my seventh iteration when I walked into my boss's boss's office and said, I'm not going to create the eighth uh, version of this script here uh, unless we bring every last one of these subject matter experts, as we called them back in those days, um, and, and brought them into a room where I could facilitate them and nail down this language here because they keep on changing things. And I found that in my seven iterations of this video script that I was changing things back to original versions and knowing full well that that was going to then be taken out by another subject matter expert. So it was quite a quagmire that I found myself in. And I've learned to deal with what I, what, what my preference is to work with master performers and then other subject matter experts as necessary. Perhaps we need somebody from regulatory affairs who doesn't know the performance, but they know the regs inside and out, and they know what's coming down the pike, what's being discussed in the, you know, at the federal or state levels or whatever your government or, uh, hierarchy is. Um, and knows what the regulations might become um, or that will be released, you know, in six weeks, six months or whatever. And so you want your instruction to be addressing the future, not the past. You want the current state reflected, but if you're not going to be releasing your instruction for a week or two or six, you know, then you want it to actually be current at the time it's being released and used by the target audience. Um, so, but that's my lesson map format, and so we articulate first a title. I rough in a title. I'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, then we identify what the performance objectives are, what the learning objectives are, the knowledge and skill objectives, if you will. Then we talk about the application exercises and how many do we need, and is this just easy peasy, or is this from Hades? What's what's needed? What are the what does the requester think? Uh, do we need a demonstration? Yes or no. What's the information before the demonstration, before the applications that make sense? Um, and then I don't bother the clients with, you know, I always have an, every lesson has an open and every lesson has a close. And in the opens, we're talking about, uh, you know, we might provide a quick demonstration of performance. We might articulate the performance objectives. We may or may not talk about the enabling knowledge and skill objectives because there's no sense boring everybody with what you got to know in order to be able to do. I also like to present a map to the learners at the beginning of every lesson is here's the flow. Here's the information, then the demonstration, then there's an application exercises. Perhaps then we're gonna give you even additional information and we may or may not give you another demonstration of how that new information folds into the application exercise you just did. We're just gonna go from info to APO. We're gonna give you new information and then we're going to expect you to incorporate that into your practice and feedback in the next APO. And there could be a series of these kinds of things. So we want to, you know, demystify the lesson, if you will, for the learner, the performer, before they start going through that. And at the end, in the close, well, we're doing several things and we might uh, do a quick objectives review, make sure that everybody knows that we actually covered and they've, you know, uh, hopefully hit the objectives, the performance objectives, the learning objectives that we're driving us. Uh, we may want to have uh, how this ties into future learning, future training, future instruction, future learnings that you're going to be uh, participating in, uh, in case there's a chain of lessons in an event, which again can be a chain of events. Um, so if you've got a, a training and development event, as I like to call them, and it's got four lessons in it, and we're talking about lesson two, we might talk about how this relates to lesson three and four so that it's, you know, again, demystified. Um, and then before we go from one lesson to the other, we might, sometimes we reserve this for later on, but we might do some structured reflection and we might do some action planning so that now that you've understand and thought about, you know, what you've learned from this and how this is different from your past practices, how this might change your practices. All right, so what are you going to do? So, you know, what's your plan of action here to incorporate this, to transfer this back to the job for you 
and maybe we want to talk about, you know, what are some of the barriers to you transferring this to your job? What are those barriers going to be? Are they going to be people, your peers, your boss? You know, what do you need to do in order to tell them about this so that it's not a surprise to them that you're changing your practices and the processes that you're, you were taught in? Um, and so what do you got to do to, to make that successful, to make the transfer happen so that you can have a positive impact back on the job for all of this? Um, so that's the, there's, so every lesson has a title um, and objectives, and it has an open information, demonstration, application, and, some, and there may be a series of those ch chains, if you will, and then there's going to be a close. Now back to titling. So I like to use what I call truth and titling, because I've been to too many training sessions, if you will, where the title didn't match what was covered, and I just like that. And that doesn't give people confidence. So I like to title my, uh, my lessons and my events um, using the following kind of a structure here. If I'm gonna cover something to an awareness level, I call it overview of colon, you know, X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z. Um, if I'm gonna cover it to a knowledge level, and I'm not intending to give you any kind of a specific skill, I'm going to call it um, uh, X, Y, Z and no preface before I get to X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z. If, on the other hand, we're intending to develop a skill in people, the title itself should, you know, forecast that. So the preface to the X, Y, Z would be how to colon X, Y, Z. And then Guy always likes to put in parentheses, no kidding. Because that's our intent, is that you're going to have this particular skill, X, Y, Z, by the time we're all done and the dust is settled. So that's my approach to backward chaining design at a lesson level. And again, lessons are the heart of my instructional design methodology. It is composed of information, demonstration, and application exercises. And I could have multiple lessons in an event, and there could be multiple events covering one task set, if you will, there, there could be some pre-event things that are done, there's the main event, and then there's the post-event. So the pre-event stuff is like a flipped classroom approach, uh, setting the stage, some pre-readings or whatever, videos, whatever that might be, interviewing people back on the job site about this so you have an understanding of what the performance is all about, and what the tricky trickiness uh, components are, what the barriers to performance are. You may be having people doing interviews. Then they come to the main event where we're going to focus on either the awareness, knowledge, or skills, or we're actually going to go from awareness to knowledge to skills within a lesson, or two, or three, or four, or more. Uh, we're going to close out the main event, and then there might be some post-event activities. We may have structured applications. We may have structured uh, interviews or briefings that you might do with your peers and with your own management to tell them, this is what I've learned. This is how I'm going to apply this. So don't think that I'm, you know, doing something radically different here than our past practices. Um, and maybe management already knows that and it's not necessary. Uh, so as always, it depends. Anyway, this is Guy Wallace and thank you for listening to my approach to backward chaining the design of instruction.